Where do we come from? How was the world around us formed? These questions are powerful reflection engines, and they answer a visceral need to know our origins, our belonging, and to understand the world around us. Our planet, the Earth, is a planet similar to the others. Like the others, it is unique. The planets share a part of their history, but have then evolved differently, developing their own individualities. The Earth is the only planet known to harbor life. Among all the organisms that have succeeded each other, one of them has demonstrated a strong capacity to master its environment and adapt it to its needs. Man. Man hates ignorance. He therefore started to study these questions very early on in order to understand the Earth. But can we really claim to know the Earth when so many interpretations and uncertainties come into play? Man studies the subject first through philosophy, then through geology. The study of the lithosphere reveals an astonishing amount of information, allowing us to go back to its formation. Today, a history of the Earth since its birth is written, but the scenario is not fixed and will continue to evolve with the discoveries. Its appearance has not always been that of the beautiful, calm, and peaceful blue planet. Its birth and early childhood took place in chaos, an unprecedented hell in which unimaginable humans. How did it evolve to become the Earth as we know it today? What was the Earth like four billion years ago? Dear Traveler, good morning. Today, we embark on a long journey through time, from the birth of the Earth to today, in order to go back to the heart of our planet at the beginning of its formation and throughout its evolution. This journey is divided into four videos, each one describing a quarter of the life of our planet. You are here in the first chapter. Before leaving for a new adventure, Think about liking the video and subscribing to the channel so you don't miss anything. Thank you, and have a nice trip! The Earth was formed precisely 4.57 billion years ago. Its formation occurred more than 9 billion years after the birth of the universe. We cannot succeed in understanding the place of the Earth if we do not put it in the context of the universe and its history. Let's go back briefly to where it all began. Thirteen point eight billion years ago, all the matter of the universe was born. A primordial atom, dimensionless and infinitely small, which contains all the energy of the universe. This precise moment is called the Big Bang. The matter and energy of the universe, as well as the dimensions of space and time, are compressed in a state of extreme density. The temperature is high, and it is in this burning environment that all matter is organized. Thirty minutes after the Big Bang, the universe reaches a temperature of 300 million degrees and a density of almost zero. Nothing happens for a few hundred thousand years. The universe continues its expansion. Its radiation prevents the heaviest elements from forming because they remain unstable. The hydrogen and helium nuclei are bathed in a sea of photons. More than 300,000 years later, the temperature reaches 3,000 degrees Celsius, or 5,432 degrees Fahrenheit. New bonds take place. It is the recombination 
and the universe becomes transparent. A first sudden emission of light arises, called the cosmic microwave background. It is a great step in the history of the universe, which is suddenly illuminated. The glow of this cosmological background is propagated to us since that time. One million years after the Big Bang, the universe is homogeneous. Its temperature reaches minus 173 degrees Celsius, or minus 279 degrees Fahrenheit. It contains no stars. The only light is that of the fossil radiation. It continues its expansion. Gigantic masses of matter are moving away from each other and clouds of hydrogen and atoms are gathering under the effect of gravity. Denser and denser clouds are formed. These are the proto-galaxies. These present inhomogeneities, resulting in areas where the matter will strongly condense until the birth of stars. The first galaxies take shape 12 billion years ago as islands of matter bathing in the intergalactic void. Stars are born everywhere. Then, a few billion years later, the first clusters of galaxies take shape. Some of the newly formed galaxies group together in a cloud, which is called a cluster. The future Milky Way is in its embryonic stage. It has its origin in the meeting of proto-galaxies. The local supercluster, Launia Kea, the basin of gravitational attraction towards which the galaxies and clusters of galaxies are moving, was formed 6.8 billion years ago. It is similar to a gigantic cosmic continent consisting of 100,000 large galaxies, including the Milky Way each containing about 100 billion stars and a million dwarf galaxies. The local group is the aggregate of galaxies in which the Milky Way is located. Four point six billion years ago, the solar system begins its formation Everything begins with the birth of the star of our solar system, the Sun. Dark energy is the main constituent of the universe. The local supercluster counts more than 10,000 celestial objects. At its periphery is the local group, consisting of about 30 galaxies, of which the Milky Way is the most prominent. Its dark matter halo has given it a thin disk formed of stars and gas, generally very cold and quite diluted since it contains only a few tens of billions of atoms per cubic centimeter. One of these interstellar clouds floats 27,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. It is composed mainly of hydrogen with a few hints of helium and other heavy elements from a supernova. A fragment of this nebula suddenly collapses on itself under the effect of gravitational attraction. The atoms accelerate and migrate towards the center, which becomes hotter and denser. The cloud adopts a spherical shape and the gas heats up to radiate energy. The sun in the making is for the moment in the form of a protostar. In order to shine like a star, in this excessively cold environment, reaching a temperature below 270 degrees Celsius or 518 degrees Fahrenheit, it must produce enough energy. The gas cloud contracts until it reaches a temperature of 10 million degrees Celsius or more than 18 million degrees Fahrenheit at its center. The fusion of hydrogen nuclei starts. The strong interaction dominates over the electric repulsion. The two hydrogen atoms combine to give an atom of helium 
and thus release energy. Up to 4 million tons of hydrogen burn by fusion every second, and the energy produced in this furnace at 15 million degrees Celsius or 27 million degrees Fahrenheit must be released. Photons produced in the center of the sun take on this task and will take 500,000 years to reach the surface. From the burning core, they cross a colder, radiative zone at 2 million degrees Celsius or 3.6 million degrees Fahrenheit and denser than a convective zone where the hot matter dissipates towards the colder outside. At the end of this journey, the matter cools down and goes back down to the bottom. Before its final contraction, the future sun is surrounded by a disk of gas and dust, which fragments into small bodies. Among these, some agglomerate into larger structures and form the planets. The disk of gas thins outward due to the decreasing gravity and is constantly fed by the dust that swirls around the young sun. The movements of the particles generate heat that dissipates in the infrared radiation range. The solar wind drives the gas and volatile compounds towards the external zones which are colder. The frost line is formed as a boundary between the internal world in which the ice is not stable and the external world in which the ice survives. Outside this line, the embryos are rather massive and manage to attract gas and coat themselves with hydrogen and helium. They continue to grow, and when the mass of this envelope reaches 100 times the mass of the Earth, it collapses on itself and gives birth to gas giant planets. This is how Jupiter and Saturn appear. The second possible scenario is that the planetary envelope disperses, leaving behind a large core of rocks and ice, like Uranus and Neptune. On the other side of the ice line, the environment is gradually depleted of its gas. The planetary embryos evolve and are sometimes brought to cross each other, which generates violent collisions between these embryos of several hundred kilometers in diameter, whose orbits are close. These shocks release a disproportionate energy. Only four objects will survive and will be qualified as telluric planets, among them the Earth. The telluric planets are formed later and more slowly than the gas giants, which seems paradoxical since they are smaller. The telluric planets all have a mantle and a core, but each has its own particularities. The closest to the Sun is Mercury, then come Venus, Earth, and Mars. Here we come to the moment that interests us, the birth of our planet Earth. The history of the Earth begins here, 4.57 billion years ago. The young sun in formation is surrounded by grains of dust that revolve around it. These materials are much too fast and do not manage to reach it. They spread out in the form of a disk, thinner in its center, made up mainly of hydrogen and helium, and strewn with tiny aggregates of substances in the solid state. Like the dust that gathers in sheep behind the furniture, the grains of substances gather and agglomerate with each other. When they reach a diameter, at least equivalent to 800 meters or 2600 feet, gravity comes into play. They suck up the surrounding dust and take the form of objects of several kilometers. These young and huge planetesimals absorb all the substances that are in their area of influence. And this is how planetary embryos are formed. They then collide with each other and merge until they give birth to some planets, including the Earth. The 
the accretion mechanism of the Earth is controlled by a gravitational rush of larger and larger bodies from a dust disk. This scenario is declined in three steps. In a first step, the dust grains are close to the symmetry plane of the nebula. They agglomerate by collision at low speed. Bodies of 10 kilometers or 6 miles in diameter are gradually formed. In the second time, the attraction of the matter towards the largest bodies is much more important than towards the smallest. Their mass increases exponentially. It is the gravitational runaway. Objects of several tens of kilometers, or half of diameter, evolve until they reach gigantic sizes of planetesimals of several hundreds of kilometers, or half of diameter. These first two stages last less than three million years. In the third and last stage, the growth stops when the mass of matter in the feeding zone is accreted. Only bodies of the size of small planets with eccentric orbits remain. This last stage is longer than the first two. Several tens of planetesimals of the size of Mars form at this time in the inner disk. They eventually collide with each other until they gradually build a planet. How do accretion bodies of a few tens of kilometers or half of diameter form planetesimals? The separation of the silicate mantle and the metallic core takes place before the accretion of the bodies. The bodies have upstream accumulate enough heat to trigger this fusion. This is possible for relatively small masses because of the energy released by the decay of radioactive elements at short period. The dust is the element which constitutes the colossal mass of an interstellar cloud. It is from it that planets take shape. Let's take a closer look at cosmic materials to determine the nature of the initial stock of chemical elements that were used to make the Earth. Interstellar dust clouds are obstacles to the transmission of light. They weaken the light intensity and modify the light spectrum. This proves that they contain a wide variety of compounds, mostly silicates, carbonaceous molecules, and pieces of carbonaceous material. But these dust grains hide an even greater diversity because each porous agglomerate contains elements which themselves contain subgrains of submicrometric or even nanometric size. Some of them are of pre-solar origin, such as nanodiamonds, silicon carbide, or corundum. The rest of the components of cosmic dust come from chemical reactions specific to the interstellar cloud or triggered by reactions between the protosun and its internal disk. Chondritic meteorites, which have chondrules, are the most abundant and primitive material of the solar nebula. Chondrites contain the original elements from which the Earth and other terrestrial planets were formed. Their composite material is formed of particles of a few microns containing microscopic minerals and carbonaceous molecules. This binder holds together the mineral inclusions rich in calcium and aluminum and the chondrules. It can only be formed during the travel of the objects in the zones of the disk far from the sun because the temperatures are sufficiently low not to alter the most fragile compounds. Propelled by the solar wind, the chondrules are covered during their journey by a thin film of clay particles in the form of a crown. The mineral fraction of the material contains, in addition to olivine and peroxine, hydrated species. These clays are essentially magnesium or ferrous and contain very little aluminum. Apart from clays, 
Carbonation chondrites contain very complex organic molecules, like amino acids or sugars. But then, what was our terrestrial planet made of 4.57 billion years ago? Carbonaceous chondrites are the most primitive elements that were formed in the solar nebula. It is from these initial atomic proportions that the planetesimals and then the planets were formed. The correspondence of the composition of the external corona of the Sun and that of the chondrites is quasi-perfect. The processes of transformation of the Earth since its formation only reshuffle the stock by moving some elements from a reservoir to another. The Earth was formed in a dry part of the solar system. The ice limit, beyond which the solar system contains icy bodies, or mineralogically constituted of water, is located much further than the orbit of Mars. The presence of water is therefore surprising, especially since the Earth will be the only planet to have it. Although part of the water is brought by meteorite collisions, it turns out that the other part comes from the famous chondrites that made up the Earth since they can be rich in water, up to 20% of their mass. The water on Earth results from a mixture between two different sources, carbonaceous chondrites and comets. The first hundred million years after the birth of the solar system are decisive in the formation of the internal structure of the telluric planets. It is during the existence of the generalized magmatic ocean that the gravitational migration of elements towards the center of the planet Earth, but also of the Moon, occurs. Their accumulation builds little by little the core. This differentiation occurs in barely 30 million years, a very short time that implies an efficient mechanism. What really happened? It all starts with a thermodynamic equilibrium that splits the metal in the silicate liquid whose densities are different. The denser phase perpetually subjected to an agitation effect ends up agglomerating into fine droplets of about one centimeter in diameter that scatter in the magma. They are then driven by their weight towards the center of the planet and stop at first at the transition with a solid mantle. Here they will undergo new modifications in their composition. They integrate some elements lighter than iron, like sulfur, silicon, or oxygen but at a depth of 1,500 kilometers, or 930 miles, the pressure is immense, more than 45 gigapascal, and especially too important for the temperature of 3,500 degrees Celsius, or 6,300 degrees Fahrenheit, to maintain the silicates in the molten state. The depth of this transition is determined by the intersection between the beginning melting curve and the geothermal gradient. The iron accumulates by forming pools of varying size. As soon as their mass exceeds a certain value, the density contrast is sufficient for them to pass through the solid matter in the form of gigantic drops called diapirs. Their coalescence gradually forms the core of the planet. It is completely melted at the beginning of the history of the Earth. With time and cooling, a solid seed is formed, where the pressure is more important, that is to say, in the center. Its rotation in the metallic liquid generates a magnetic field by dynamo effect. However, not all the siderophilic elements are found in the core. The partition coefficient between the two parts varies according to the pressure, the temperature, and the oxygen content. The fineness of the chemical equilibrium that comes into play between metal and silicate leads to deviations. 
only one-third of the iron is integrated in the core. A large amount persists in the mantle, along with other siderophile elements. The core of the Earth takes nearly 30 million years to form. In terms of geological time, this is a very short time. Its completion corresponds to the giant impact it underwent at the origin of the Moon. The core, at its completion, is a reservoir of liquid iron, but has no solid seed. Its shape is not a perfect sphere, and its center, and that of the planet, may not coincide. The iron and nickel are accompanied by other elements in their migration towards the center, mostly light elements like oxygen and silicon, representing about 10% of the total mass of the core. The formation of a solid seed is impossible because of the extremely high temperature. This has a significant consequence on the emergence of life because in the absence of internal dynamo, the Earth is deprived of magnetic field. The Earth in its primitive form is a ball of molten lava. It is continuously hit by bodies and meteorites, making the rocks enter in fusion at each place of impact. These are innumerable, and the planet reaches up to 4,700 degrees Celsius, or 8,500 degrees Fahrenheit, at its surface. After a hundred million years, the surface of the planet is covered with a crust of frozen rocks of basalts and comatites which cracks and drifts with the effervescence of the depths. The mantle of the Earth is solid and is made of a part in olivine and another in perovskite. The still relatively high temperature stimulates the convection cells that continue to stir these materials. Their viscosity does not yet make them a completely solid structure and they are continuously deformed after 160 million years, the generalized magmatic ocean is completely crystallized. After the exponential growth of its mass, the young Earth goes through a period of calm, during which the meteoric impacts decrease considerably. Once 90% of its mass has been accreted, a major event occurs, thanks to which the Earth will reach its current size. A last giant impact with the planet Thea. The young Earth continues its evolution. Its accretion is almost finished. Following the period of gravitational runaway, it has reached 90% of its current mass. It has cooled down and reached a temperature of 1100 degrees Celsius or 2012 degrees Fahrenheit at its surface. The solar system continues to be violently bombarded by asteroids. Although its accretion zone is cleansed, the Earth will then undergo an important collision with another protoplanet of the size of the planet Mars, a celestial companion transiting on a neighboring orbit which answers to the name of Thea. Thea violently impacts the planet. A significant amount of material is ejected far from the Earth. Thea is completely dislocated, as well as the external layer and part of the mantle. A large part of the iron of its core is transferred to the Earth. A ring of debris is formed around the Earth, and then a crete in a very short time, about a hundred years, and form a satellite the moon. The energy involved in the impact is considerable. Billions of tons of material are melted and vaporized. In some parts of the Earth, temperatures of up to 10,000 degrees Celsius, or more than 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit, were recorded. The outer layer of the Earth melts into an ocean of magma over 1,000 kilometers, or 620 miles deep. 
the melting of the silicates generates a silicon pore magma. The original silicate solids that are denser make up the lower mantle. The alloy of iron and nickel, which is even denser, migrates towards the center and carries with it elements with a strong affinity for iron, such as platinum, gold, iridium, or tungsten. The Earth is similar to a lava empire. It is now made up of a liquid core of about 3,400 kilometers or 2,100 miles in diameter, a lower mantle, 1,900 kilometers or 1,200 miles thick, and an upper mantle, the magma ocean, 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles thick. The fusion of the upper mantle let escape almost all the gases. An atmosphere begins to form. The Earth has neither water nor crust. The solar system is then much too hot to allow water to exist in liquid form. It does not contain enough hydrogen for its oxygen to form water. The energy required to agglomerate the material in orbit around the Earth is sufficiently large to also melt part of the Moon and create a lunar magma ocean of several hundred kilometers or half a mile in depth composed of molten silicates. Due to its relatively small size and lack of radioactive elements, this magma is not kept in a liquid state for very long, just long enough for accretion. The newly formed Moon has a relatively small iron core. This is explained by the fact that the core of Thea has mostly merged with that of the Earth. The Moon will keep the scars of this shock. The Earth will be reshaped by volcanic activity and erosion. The collision causes the tilt of the axis of the Earth of 23.5 degrees, which generates the seasons. The Earth's axis is the imaginary line that connects the North Pole to the South Pole. It is around him that the planet makes its rotation. During the collision between Thea and the Earth, this axis of inclination is derived from the ecliptic plane, the plane of the Earth's orbit around the Sun. The axis is always directed in the same direction, but during a part of the year, the northern hemisphere is inclined towards the sun. Then, during the second part of the year, it is the southern hemisphere. The sun heats more the temperature inclined in its direction when it is summer. It heats less the opposite hemisphere when it is winter. During spring and autumn, the sun provides a similar amount of heat to both hemispheres. The couple, Earth-Moon, of considerable dimensions and being located at relatively close distances, will undergo the effects of the gravitation, what will cause the phenomenon of forces of tides. The Moon will have effects on the parts of the Earth that are closest to it at a given time. The point of the Earth's surface facing it will be more affected by the force of gravity than the point of the surface opposite it at the same time. The Earth is subject to differential forces that will stretch it towards the Moon and compress it towards the poles. The most obvious effect of this influence is on the least rigid part of the Earth, the ocean. Its liquid state reacts easily to the influence of local gravity, which generates the phenomenon of tides the two bulges of the Earth being symmetrical, a given point will undergo two high and two low tides per day. The Sun is also involved in the tidal phenomenon. It is located much further from our planet than the Moon, but it participates in the creation of a tidal force equivalent to half that of the Moon. It is the sum of the tidal forces coming from the Moon and the Sun that determines the real amplitude of the tide. The tidal forces will also have an effect on the rigid parts of the Earth. 
The Earth's crust is thus stretched in the direction of the Moon under its influence. If the Moon and the Earth had identical rotation periods, the bulge would be constantly pointed towards the Moon. However, the rotation of the satellite is much slower than that of our planet. The bulge of the Earth is rigid and driven by the rotation of the planet itself, which makes it gravitate faster than the Moon and point ahead of its movement. The gravitational attraction of the Moon on the bulge will direct it backwards and prevent it from following the movement of the Earth. Over millions and billions of years, this gravitational gain will slow down the rotation of the Earth and will increase the orbital moment of the Moon, which will cause a progressive distance of this one and a decrease of its speed of revolution. The period of rotation of the Earth increasing and that of the Moon decreasing, the two objects will converge towards a situation of synchronous rotation. From this moment, the Moon will always present its same face to our planet. The surface of the Earth is covered by a layer of magma during its first millions of years of existence. The continents are not yet formed. The oceans that form are vaporized from time to time because of the impacts of giant asteroids. The sun shines weakly at this time. The Earth underwent many collisions which caused the release of a gigantic amount of energy and melted some of its matter. The ocean of magma that covers its surface and on 1,000 kilometers or 620 miles deep reaches 2,000 degrees Celsius or 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit and rejects hydrogen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, silicates, nitrogen. The Earth undergoes an enormous degassing. The atmosphere thickens. It becomes stifling and darkens the sky. The pressure is unbearable. The heat that radiates into space has, however, a significant effect. It makes the temperature on the planet fall. The Earth cools down, and under the influence of radioactivity, its core heats up. Convection movements take place. The material that makes up the mantle rises towards the surface at the level of the ridges by a few centimeters per year then falls back down at the level of the subduction zones. The heat is expelled on the hardened surface in the form of volcanic eruptions. A few fragments of crust appear here and there, like small islands floating on a vicious magma. The volcanoes, in turn, release gases into the atmosphere. The water of the magma dissolves and will decrease the density of the latter to the point that the crust can no longer float. The lavas are at this time composed of cometitic basalts and cometites forming a continuous series between a pole very rich in magnesium and poor in calcium and aluminum. Cometites are a kind of petrographic fossils coming from the fusion of the mantle rocks essentially composed of olivine and pyroxene. No more volcanoes produce them today. Subjected to high temperature, these lavas have a very low viscosity and flow like water. At the interface with the atmosphere, these lavas undergo a thermal shock which generates the formation of skeletal crystals of olivine which resemble fish bones and become entangled. The crystallization of the densest minerals occurs at 1,000 kilometers, or 620 miles. The magnesium silicate takes the structure of a perovskite. At the surface, the irregular pack of rocks frozen and fragmented by the turbulence of the magma and by the meteoric impacts that do not cease begins to flow fragments after fragments. It is therefore the differences in density that will define the structure of the magmatic ocean during its cooling. These differences in density are themselves related to the water content 
and the difference in pressure depending on the depth. The crustal fragments plunge downward to the magma density transition limit at 250 kilometers or 155 miles. This is also where olivines that float up from the depths accumulate and where dunites, solid rocks that isolate two compartments of the magma ocean, form. The two spaces shrink as the Earth's heat escapes and the dunite zone expands both upward and downward. Violent turbulences fall on the Earth. The upper part is strongly disturbed and mobile ice flows of basalt rocks move on the surface. The moon is located at only 25,000 kilometers from the Earth, that is to say, at only 15,000 miles from the Earth, and triggers gigantic tides. The mass of magma gives off unbearable heat, yet in some places on the surface it is cold. The solar energy is rather weak, and is compensated by a powerful greenhouse effect of an atmosphere filled with carbon dioxide, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. It occurs an energy deficit which causes the solidification of the lava. Packs of basalts and cometites, partly serpentinized, float and are displaced on the upper part of the magmatic ocean. A strong thermal gradient is established between the surface and the depths, and numerous very active convection cells are formed. The protocrust that forms above the magma ocean is described as an ice pack whose elements drift, but the composition of the lava at that time and its reaction with water played a big role. The earth, which is very hot, maintains several convection cells. Their ascending branches emerge at the surface in the manner of volcanic chains comparable to the mid-oceanic ripples that limit the plates and produce a lot of lava. Their gigantic cumulated length allows them to evacuate internal heat. Nevertheless, even if the conditions are extremely difficult, liquid water exists at the interface with the atmosphere since proto-oceans form and reform even after undergoing impacts that vaporize them. Aqueous alteration reactions cause the formation of magnesian clay at the surface and the transformation of olivines and peroxines into serpentine at depth. Recycled in the magmatic ocean, these minerals serve as a carrier to introduce water molecules in what will form the upper mantle. Water is everywhere. It decreases the melting point of silicates and thus allows a melting at a lower temperature. It is a real water cycle that is set up between the rocks and the atmosphere. The more the heat of the earth is evacuated, the more the rock ice flows are formed. These islands are surrounded by water, the oceans, which begin to become permanent, fed by continuous rainfall. The primitive plates collide. Their fragments fall into the underlying molten material. They mix and give birth to new forms of magma that rise to the surface due to their low density. The volcanoes are fed and reject lava richer in silica. A few kilometers from the interface with the atmosphere, they crystallize and form plutons, massive rocks composed of feldspars, micas, and quartz. The latter constitute a particular family of rocks whose history is supported by crystals called zircon. This mineral of the Earth's crust is used nowadays for radiometric dating because of its strong resistance to chemical changes. It takes the form of crystals or grains in igneous and metamorphic host rocks. It remains in the future in very low abundance because plate tectonics implies a recycling of materials. When the rock is buried deeply, 
it becomes heated and can melt or recrystallize. These rocks in formation are the beginning of real continents. Their density is lower than the magma below them, so they float on the surface. Attached to the plutons, they form cratons, the outlines of future continents. The Earth begins to take shape in the structure that is more or less familiar to us. The Earth has cooled down a lot. The temperature of its oceanic crust and the subduction zones is increasing by only 15 to 20 degrees Celsius per kilometer. That is an increase of 68 degrees Fahrenheit per mile. The metamorphic reactions it undergoes produce water continuously due to the destruction of hydroxyl, radical containing minerals such as serpentine. It is in depths of more than 100 kilometers that the last hydroxylated species disappear, what generates the formation of rocks composed entirely of anhydrous minerals. The water released reaches the overlying mantle decreasing the melting point of the periotites. They melt in a proportion not exceeding 10 to 15 percent. The geothermal gradient is at that time much stronger than today. The rapid rise in temperature with depth leads to the dehydration and melting of the oceanic plate from 50 kilometers or 30 miles depth. The geothermal gradient decreases Increasingly frequent interactions occur with the mantle as the oceanic plate melts at increasing depths. The Earth reaches its present size. It is still subject to the colossal energy released during the collision. The materials that compose it melt. The iron, more dense, flows towards the center and allies with nickel. After hundreds of millions of years, this core, which has become a liquid and bubbling nucleus, begins to cool. But this cooling does not take place in a homogeneous way in all the core. The differences in temperature between the outer layer and the center cause convection movements in the fluid, which settle in a gigantic magnetic field, that of the sun. Molten iron is a conductive element. If it is set in motion in a magnetic field, it generates an electric current, which in turn creates a magnetic field added to the primitive field. The magnetic field will now protect the Earth from the effects of solar flares. Like a shield, it protects the atmosphere, and subsequently, the first forms of life from meteorological hazards with often devastating effects. The impactors of the proto-Earth, whether thea, planetesimals, or meteorites, are made of rocks, metals, gases, but also a large quantity of water ice. During impacts, some of the energy released is transmitted to the lighter elements, freeing them from the Earth's attraction. Other impacts release volatile elements on Earth. The solar wind is a devastating and burning wind. It sweeps everywhere in its path. All traces of atmosphere are blown to the depths of the solar system. This hellish wind reaches a temperature of more than 700 degrees Celsius or 1,290 degrees Fahrenheit. The solar wind dissipates the light elements in the interplanetary medium. It is very intense at that time because the sun turns on itself three times faster than today, and its activity is more intense. While the young star burns deuterium to form helium-3, its temperature rises and it expels huge puffs of ionized gas, mainly composed of hydrogen. The young Earth is made of very few light elements because hydrogen and deuterium are concentrated mainly in the sun. As soon as the solar wind calms down, the Earth begins the constitution of a new atmosphere. 
the dust and pebbles that form the primitive Earth are made of molecules capable of vaporizing like water and silicates. Violent phenomena will come in some time to release them. Due to a lack of oxygen, the ozone layer is not yet formed. The water vapor contained in the atmosphere is therefore photodissociated into hydrogen atoms that escape into space under the effect of UV radiation. The primitive atmosphere contains carbon dioxide and nitrogen in great proportion. In addition, there is methane, sulfur dioxide, ammonia, and hydrochloric acid, a composition identical to that of Venus today. The atmosphere is tinted pink due to methane of volcanic, meteoric, and cometary origin. The planet looks like a real pressure cooker. The water is very hot, around 200 degrees Celsius or 392 degrees Fahrenheit, and strongly concentrated in salt. The pressure of the primitive atmosphere is dense and loaded with water vapor and carbon dioxide, much higher than the current pressure. The crust that forms on the surface of the Earth prevents heat exchange with the outside and causes a brutal cooling. The water vapor present in the atmosphere condenses and a real deluge falls on the whole surface of the Earth. The latter, still very hot and still bombarded by asteroids, receives precipitation of the order of 4 to 7 millimeters of water per year, i.e. 10 times more than the rain that falls in the current tropical zones. In only a thousand years, the totality of the oceans is formed. These oceans do not stay in place for long. As soon as an asteroid of more than 5 kilometers or more than 3 miles in diameter falls on the Earth, it produces such an energy that it vaporizes all the water in place until then. The bombardment calms down, the atmosphere cools down, and the oceans reform. Until the next impact. Asteroids and comets do not only have negative effects on the arrival of water on Earth, their contents are rich in water and partly join the atmosphere. Earth is composed of large basaltic plateaus and proto-continents. The gas giant planets are in full migration. The effects of gravitational resonance depopulate the asteroid belt of Jupiter and the proximal zone of the Kuiper belt with Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. A redoubling of cometary and meteoric impacts occurs during a few million years the Moon, Mars, Mercury, and the Earth are violently hit. Their surface is marked by numerous impact craters. Some asteroids impacting the Earth have a diameter larger than the size of France. The shocks are so violent that the energy released is enough to vaporize part of the oceans. This heavy late bombardment changes the appearance of the Earth and reintroduces chemical elements that were no longer present in negligible quantities. The surface is as if sown with new seeds. The possibilities of inorganic and organic transformations that occur in contact with the water of the oceans and the atmosphere are revolutionized. It is an open door to the development of life. The large bombardments leave place to bombardments of smaller bodies. The impacts no longer vaporize the water of the Earth. On the contrary, they supply it. The oceans swell. The carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere dissolves in these primitive oceans and makes them very acid. The silicate minerals are disintegrated. The iron, which is not yet oxidized, is released into the ocean in soluble form and gives it a green-brown color. The landscape becomes rather calm, as if it was preparing to welcome life. 
the pinkish sky covers a large part of the surface of the Earth. The blue planet is not yet so blue. Volcanic gases rising from the Earth's mantle give rise to chlorine, among other things. Meteorites, especially chondrites, contain molten silicates. It is through these two vectors that the Earth is forged with salt. The lighter elements are found on the surface, where they are eroded and then moved to the sea by water and wind. The oceans finally reach their final volume. The Earth seems to calm down. This was without counting on the heavy crust that is cooled and frozen on the surface, which begins to fragment under its own weight and to melt under the heat of the bowels of the Earth. But this does not prevent life from making a first appearance. Traditionally, a planet becomes habitable as soon as water is stable on the surface. This assumes that life is based on the chemistry of water, but also of carbon. The carbon atom is one of the most favorable for the establishment of bonds and consequently for the formation of longer and more sophisticated molecules with diversified properties, organic molecules are not stable when the temperature is high. It is necessary to wait until the temperature drops below 150 degrees Celsius or 300 degrees Fahrenheit for life to appear. Life at this time is totally bacterial. The first organic molecules are built by physico-chemical phenomena, such as the evaporation of water, the reaction of water molecules with gases contained in the atmosphere, condensation, and precipitation in rain. The prebiotic soup is then transported to the oceans through water runoff. This soup leads to the formation of a kind of membrane on the surface of the water. Shaken by the current, the membrane breaks up into droplets that enclose other molecules separated from the surrounding environment. The coacervates. Bacteria at this time feed on the chemical transformation of organic molecules present in the aquatic environment. After a certain time, because of a lack of food, they start to eat each other. This first act of predation allows a fundamental step in the natural selection and the improvement of the characteristics, since only the best adapted survive. The coacervate is then like a closed system, and its composition is distinct from that of the solutions that surround it. It still lacks the signature of real cells since it is devoid of proteins, enzymes, and RNA. The emergence of life is, in a very simplified way, a two-step process involving a purely chemical mechanism, prebiotic chemistry, then a series of complex biogeochemical reactions resulting from the very first manifestations of biological activity. The second stage already belongs to the living world and leads the coacervates to become richer until they reach the stage of protobionts, a kind of capsule delimited by a lipidic membrane which contains an emulsion of organic products, lipids, sugars, and proteins. They are the premises of protocells, are not free and very dependent on their mineral support. Then, catalysis by enzymes and ribosomes replace the mineral surfaces. A true autotrophic metabolism, which feeds on inorganic products provided by the environment, emerges. The protobionts see their mass increase and manage to divide. The structure becomes more complex and resembles that of bacteria. This is where LUCA is located, the last universal common ancestor from which all life emerges on Earth. It is not the first living organism, but a complex organism already resulting 
from a long evolution guided by natural selection. LUCA is a non-free cell, very dependent on its mineral support, confined in the micropores of alkaline hydrothermal vents. It presents a metabolism based on redox reactions and is able to reproduce. It cannot feed on pre-existing organic matter. On the other hand, it has enzymes involved in the metabolism of nucleotides and a primordial ribosome that synthesizes proteins. LUCA has a complex cellular structure. As soon as LUCA has been able to synthesize the lipid and protein components of its membranes, it evolves in a prokaryotic living being and sets itself free. The world of bacteria opens up to a whole planet to colonize. Some of them become heterotrophic and release methane and oxygen. In the continental cores and around them, belts of green volcanic rocks with their erosion products are set up. Among these rocks, comatites come from deep magmas generated by extensive melting of more than 20% of the Earth's mantle. This suggests a lot of heat to melt such a large part of the mantle. These mountain ranges that are set up are immediately prey to erosion. This is the phenomenon of orogeny. The tectonic movements of the Earth's crust gradually lead to the formation of a supercontinent called Valbara. A supercontinent is a continental mass that includes several continents. They form in cycles through fragmentation and assembly actions influenced by plate tectonics. The supercontinents block the heat flow from the interior of the Earth, which causes an increase in the heat of the athenosphere and sometimes the appearance of seismic phenomena on the lithosphere as the formation of volcanoes. The magma that rises and some fragments of the supercontinent spread until it breaks up. The reformation of supercontinents occurs when the fragments meet after having drifted to the surface of the Earth. The supercontinent Valbara is formed by the contraction of two Cratons, Capval and Pilbara. The Cratons are the first mountains of the early Earth. Born from a gigantic volcanic activity, these gigantic peaks ignore earthquakes and reach depths of 200 to 300 kilometers, up to 186 miles. The Capval Craton covers an area of 1,200,000 square kilometers, or more than 460,000 square miles, in the present Limpopo province of South Africa. Its formation and stabilization is due to the presence of granitic batholiths that thickened and stabilized the continental crust. The Pilbara Craton, on the other hand, is located in the current Pilbara region of Western Australia. These two cratons are the only two preserved continental crusts. Single-celled organisms living in water and colonies, they are the first elements of the food chain capable of using sunlight as an energy source. Cyanobacteria are unicellular and do not have a nucleus. They are composed of two differentiated zones. In the periphery, it is the chromoplasma, which ensures photosynthesis and the functions of respiration and nitrogen fixation. In the center of the cell, the centroplasma contains the DNA. They are most often filamentous and slimy. They synthesize their own food through photosynthesis and produce waste products, including oxygen. Photosynthesis is the best known and most widespread mode of chemical energy production, using light and developed by living beings in order to feed themselves. 
It is carried out thanks to chlorophyll organic pigments. Photosynthesis comes in two variants, oxygenic and anaxogenic. The latter is the oldest. It concerns only bacteria, such as green bacteria of sulfur, purple bacteria, or heliobacteria. Living in aqueous medium, devoid or poor in oxygen, and containing dissolved, reduced sulfur. The active pigments of these bacteria are bacteriochlorophylls. Oxygenic photosynthesis, on the other hand, is performed by cyanobacteria and eukaryotes, such as algae and land plants, which are organisms that feed without assimilating other organisms. Their active pigments are chlorophylls. Photosynthesis belongs to the class of chemical equations of oxidation reduction. Solar radiation provides the energy for the reaction. The pigments capture the light energy. The core of these pigments is a cyclic chemical structure enclosing a magnesium atom. The chlorophyll pigments absorb preferably red sunlight, hence their green color, while bacteriochlorophyll pigments have a preference for red light and near-infrared. Cyanobacteria populate stromalites, half-living, half-rocky structures formed by a filamentous bacterial gelatin that traps carbon from the air to incorporate it as sediment in the rock. Stromatolites are formed by an amazing process. The first colony of bacteria is smothered under a carpet of stone, hence the name stromatolites, since stroma means carpet in Greek and lithos means stone. Another colony of bacteria comes to settle on this mineral sheet until forming a rock. The construction of stromatolites is slow, since they gain only 0.4 millimeters per year on average. Their forms can vary according to the depth and the movements of water. The sun shines a pale yellow, almost extinguished, which barely dissipates the darkness that reigns on Earth. In the sky, Black stagnant ash clouds spread, and a sulfur smell fills the atmosphere. Jets of basaltic lava rise into the air, hundreds of meters high, before falling back to the Earth's surface. The fissures release plumes of white-blue steam from boiling lava. These lavas contain a high proportion of olivine, silicate of iron and magnesium, a high calcium to aluminum ratio, and an extreme richness in magnesium, up to 30%. The intensity of solar radiation emitted is 20 to 30% lower than today. Comparatively, if the Earth's atmosphere had the same composition as our atmosphere today, the planet would have completely frozen in only a few hundred years this paradox of the cold sun can be explained by several hypotheses. Even if the sun heats less, life is much less developed. The living organisms did not release much oxygen or use the CO2 to precipitate it into carbonate. The vegetation being non-existent, the roots do not consume the CO2 of silicate rocks. The atmosphere is then 10 to 100 times richer in CO2 than today. Methane, in the absence of oxygen, is not oxidized into CO2 and persists in its original form. It is considerably present in the atmosphere. It is thanks to this large amount of greenhouse gases that the Earth has a temperate climate and that liquid water is present. The first living organisms in the water use the sun's radiation to transform water and CO2 into carbohydrates. 
This transformation process releases a waste product, oxygen. The latter is very harmful for the living of the time. Some strict, anaerobic organisms see oxygen as a deadly poison. It is not a toxic element by itself, but by the derivatives that it will form in contact with certain other biological substances, with, for example, the superoxide ion or hydrogen peroxide. Aerobic organisms have systems that make these derivatives harmless, but the first living organisms have an increased sensitivity to oxygen. Oxygen does not immediately accumulate in the atmosphere because it is produced by living organisms in the oceans. In reaction with the iron present in the water, it precipitates into iron oxide and thus remains limited to the aquatic environment. After a billion years, the iron in the oceans is totally oxidized and it is then that oxygen gradually reaches the atmosphere. Many organisms succumb when oxygen appears. Some manage to escape by finding shelter in niches devoid of oxygen. Then others are forced to evolve to survive in this environment that becomes hostile and become aerobic. The evolution in aerobic passes at first by enzymes which are satisfied to neutralize the poisons created by oxygen. Then the cell membrane adapts and appears the first system coupling the consumption of oxygen to the assembly ATP. The organisms become, with time, more and more dependent on oxygen for their energy supply, and finally appear the aerobic bacteria. Succeeding the supercontinent Valbara, the paleocontinent Ur emerges, following successive collisions of different island arcs of volcanic origin. The continental crust is sufficiently developed and significantly modifies the chemical composition of the upper mantle. Magmatic differentiation impoverishes the upper mantle as more and more granitic magmas are extracted from it. The earth has cooled further, and this causes an increase in mantle viscosity. The angle of subduction is increasing, and if the plate is still melting, the resulting magmas are easily mixed with those from mantle melting. New continental lands continue to form. The temperature of the Earth's bowels cools. The basalt continues to sink and dehydrates at the same time, which prevents it from melting. Its water that rises to the surface moistens part of the mantle, which begins to melt and shape new fragments of continental crust of completely different composition. The masses travel at such a power that they will end up assembling into a new supercontinent. In the more than one billion years since its formation, the Earth has changed both in composition and appearance. After a period of hell, calm returns and a discrete life can begin to develop. This life will find itself confronted with new upheavals and will have to evolve and adapt to these changes in conditions that are imposed on it. Our journey stops here for today. Are you curious to discover what the Earth looked like three billion years ago? See you in the next video.